So today is, um, it's, it's Global Mission Sunday, and usually we have Global Mission Sunday in January. Um, this has not been a usual year, as you know. Um, um, we had intended today for um, Dr. Blunt, who I'll introduce in a moment, to be our, uh, our speaker and our preacher. Um, uh, with COVID and with us going, moving from virtual to in-person worship, um, that got um, a little difficult logistically, um, but we will hear from Dr. Blunt in our pulpit at another time. Um, if, you, if you are new to the global mission conversation at First Prez, I want to let you know that we have four global partners we, uh, we have a partnership in Russia with Hope Baptist Church in Ryazan, Russia. Um, we have a partnership in Mexico on the Yucatan Peninsula with a ministry called Action Ministries. Um, we have a partnership in Haiti, in Bayane, um, uh, Operation um, for Christ in Bayane, Haiti. And we have a partnership in Cuba with the, um, the seminary, the Protestant seminary in Matanzas, Cuba. Um, what's, I think, significant is that all those partnerships, the newest of those is Cuba, um, but many, many of those partnerships have uh, lots of years in, in relationship that we've invested in them, 20, 30 years uh, in the case of Mexico. Um, and I think that, you know, as a church, those partnerships are important for three reasons. Um, one is that uh, it's we, we partner because the ministry each of these um, each of these groups does is really important um, for the sake of the gospel. Um, the second reason is it builds relationships between our congregation, our members, and um, and members of, of those ministries and those whom they serve. And the third reason that global mission is really important to us is that it 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 it. Uh, it helps, it helps alleviate a myopia that we often get um, when we think that the church is, you know, uh, on 200 West Trade Street. And global partnerships remind us of the fact that the church is a worldwide uh, body. And so our partnerships help, um, help, us, help connect us to that. Um, and so typically, again, we have Global Mission Sunday where we have a class in the fellowship hall. And the purpose of that is to kind of lift our gaze and help see the broader uh, global church. Um, and today, that's what we're going to be doing in this class. Um, our teacher today, our speaker, is the Reverend Dr. Brian Blunt. Um, Brian is the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, and also in Charlotte. Um, if you all don't know, Union has a campus um, uh, on Sharon Presbyterian Church grounds near South Park. Um, uh, Brian is uh, beyond president. He is a professor of New Testament at Union Seminary. Um, he also uh, has served on the faculty at Princeton Theological Seminary and early in his ministry was a pastor in Tidewater, Virginia at Carver Memorial Presbyterian Church, which he just reminded me before the call is famous, um, not because of Dr. Blunt, but because one of their members um, was Katherine Johnson, who you may remember from the movie Hidden Figures. She attended that church and was a member. Um, uh, Brian is married um, and has two daughters. He is the author of many books, including commentaries on Revelation and Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Um, you may not have read those commentaries, but I guarantee you, you know something about them because whenever I preach on Revelation or the Gospel of Mark, you, by proxy, benefit from Brian's work. Um, uh, Brian is a gifted preacher. He is a dynamic leader um, and offering courageous leadership at a time when the church and um, the endeavor of theological education are both going through tremendous change. Um, at, at our Global Mission Sunday, we have often, um, this is the third time since I've been here, We've invited seminary presidents to, to be our speakers and to be our preachers because seminary presidents have an eye on the horizon and they are connected to the global church. Um, one way is because Presbyterian seminaries always have international students. And so there are relationships that get built over time 
And seminaries also have partnerships with other seminaries around the world. And so, um, Brian, I'm grateful for your friendship uh, and for your ministry and for your time today. Um, what we're going to do, y'all, is we're going to have about 30 minutes of uh, conversation that um, I, I'll be asking Brian a few questions and we'll have some back and forth, he and I together. And then um, um, after that, we'll open it up to have about 10 minutes of questions from you um, uh, based on what um, you learned today or what other questions you have about global, global mission in general. So a um, uh, reminder, if you have not, uh, I think everybody's muted. Um, we'll take you off the mute when we get to the, the discussion time. But why don't we, as we start the class, why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Let us pray. Gracious God, we do give you thanks that you, um, that you manifest in all parts of this world, that your body, Christ's body, is, is not just our church, but is, um, is lived and uh, enacted and embodied in communities of faith and institutions that, um, that span uh, in every country. And for that, we are grateful, and we ask that you would continue to help us to to nurture those relationships and to find hope in the ways that you are active and alive in the world that you indeed came to save. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, um, so Brian, um, I, 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 you may have some introductory words um, of your own, but um, I, I'd like to first ask if you can just give us your impression on the state of the global church right now. And what are some things that the, the, the global church, what, what are they grappling with? Where is their energy? Where is the Holy Spirit um, moving in your experience of that? Thank you, Ben. And it is wonderful to see all of your faces on my screen this morning. And it is a delight for me to be here with you. I look forward to the time I'll be able to be with you in person and I hope that will come up uh, very soon. As Penn said, we do have that campus um, in Charlotte. So I am, uh, as soon as travel is now, um, as it's beginning to open up, I'll be back and forward in Charlotte. So I hope one of those times I'll be able to come by the church and have opportunity to be with all of you in person. I'm looking forward to that day. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, global church and uh, its place, or, or at least as in my perspective now where um, it is, let me start um, with the smaller part of uh, where Union is in connection with it and how I'm able to see it through the lens of Union Seminary. We have, um, for the last several years, developed a global mission center for Christian education, and its primary goal is to connect the seminary and the church with the broader church and theological education in the broader um, Christian world. So one of the things that we've been able to do is build relationships with churches and seminaries, as, as Penn has noted. That for, as a matter of fact, we're just in, we're just in conversation. We're continuing it. Uh, we were starting just before the pandemic with the seminary in Cuba that um, you all have a partnership and relationship with. So we're beginning that process, as a matter of fact. When we have uh, the advisory board meetings from the global missions, um, as we did uh, just um, last week, uh, we have representatives on the screen um, from as far away as Kenya and India, Taiwan, um, and uh, um, um, uh, the United Kingdom, England, and then, of course, uh, persons in the United States. We also have a representative in Ghana. Uh, so uh, we have had, uh, even in our advisory committee meetings, a piece of the global church as a part of what we're doing. What I see happening um, are partnerships building um, through relationships like ours and relationships like there at, um, at First Church Charlotte. We're able to connect with communities across the globe because of our opportunities of travel, because of technology. Um, what I'm seeing is that there is... Um, a sense of revitalization, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, I am seeing um, situations and circumstances where the United States, churches in the United States are somewhere in the middle of a spectrum where you have a, a sense of 
I'm not sure the right word would be decline, but it's decline in terms of church attendance and membership in Eastern and Western Europe. Um, we are in the middle of that space. And then on the Southern um, hemisphere, Africa and Asia, you see a revitalization that's taking place. So there's a continuum and we're in the middle of that continuum in the United States. You just saw uh, probably one of the latest Gallup poll um, results that indicated that um, less now than 50% of uh, Americans find themselves or call themselves um, members of religious organizations. So it's more than just churches, it's synagogues and temples as well. Um, but that is the lowest it's been since the 1930s. So we're in a period of transition in the US um, and we're watching the rest of the world. And we're, I think still in many places, able to um, provide leadership in terms of theological education, but we're also finding that we are um, a part of the world that uh, many um, um, say, particularly in the Southern um, um, Hemisphere, um, see as a place of mission and evangelism. When I was last in Korea, uh, I found it fascinating that um, Korean Presbyterians were sending missionaries to Africa um, and to the United States. Uh, we were one of the, or we are one of the places before the pandemic, uh, where um, places where churches are um, um, very engaged and communities are very engaged. We're one of the places that um, churches are concerned about. I will also say we have one of our trustees is um, was a pastor of a significant church in Seoul, Korea, um, went on to be president of a small um, um, theological institution in Korea and now is retired. Uh, but um, he has shared with me that uh, Korea even has now hit a plateau. That's what he calls it in terms of religious um, or, or, or affiliation, religious affiliation. So it's not just the Presbyterian church, but it's the Methodist, it's the Baptist, and it's other kinds of religious traditions in South Korea. So he was beginning to recognize, or South Korea is beginning to recognize, that there is also um, this trend towards secularization that is impacting and um, having inroads even in the Southern Hemisphere. So that's a place of concern, I would say. So that sense of concern that's growing from Eastern and Western Europe to the United States, now even beginning inroads in the Southern Hemisphere is um, a reason for, I think, concern. A reason for joy and celebration is that there is a movement of the spirit in individual um, churches and in individual theological institutions around the world that is seeing, at least in my perspective, both in terms of statistics and when I've been on the ground in um, theological institutions around the world, where um, the number of persons who have a sense of call to ministry are growing in terms of enrollment. So the question becomes, is there, are we on the cusp of um, another sense of awakening because of a growing number of younger leaders who are around the world going into theological education with a mindset toward becoming leaders in the life of the church? I see the spirit moving powerfully in that way. I was in um, a seminary in Hong Kong, um, Three years ago, I guess it was now, we were, we were building a relationship with uh, the seminary. There are two seminaries there. That little island has 21 seminaries. This is, I mean, this is a, 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 an incredible um, kind of situation where a little island like that with that many seminaries and they're really active and they're having um, um, growth spurts in terms of enrollment of students. But in this case, uh, one of the things I was incredibly excited about was that as I was walking through the campus, the president was telling me about uh, this class of students, um, which is a very rich in terms of number of students, a significant number of students who were there. And um, I was asking them how they were doing in their coursework. He said, well, they haven't started coursework yet. I think mean, there were like 50 students who were in the incoming class who hadn't even started coursework. And I said, well, why haven't they started coursework? He said, well, first they're learning the language. Um, and I, I, learning the language, they learn to speak English, um, learning to speak English because they're coming from countries all over the world. And part of their program was that they bring in students 
who can't speak uh, the language that's spoken at the seminary, but they spend their first year learning the language so that they can then begin the three years of theological education. That kind of hunger represents a growing sense of the spirit driving students to theological education to find the resources, even when they don't have the language, but willing to learn the language, spend a year of their time learning the language before they can even begin to start the course. That is a little snapshot of where I see the spirit powerfully moving in the world church. And one of the things we're hoping to do uh, at uh, Union Seminary is through our Global Mission Center is to bring international students in a larger number, particularly from developing countries um, and Africa especially, um, to bring to our campus to have this, a similar kind of impact that that, semin that little seminary in Hong Kong was able to have. So we have resources. We have wonderful resources in our churches and our seminaries in the United States. Um, I think where I'm excited is how we are beginning to use those resources to equip um, the broader global church. And as we equip the broader global church, I think the um, excitement and the spiritual um, enrichment that they bring with them naturally will be brought um, and will infect in the nicest of ways our campuses and our schools and, and churches here in the United States as well. So we're in a continuum. But um, I don't think that continuum is, is, is pointed in a negative direction. I think we are seeing signs where there is a hopeful, powerful, global emphasis of the movement of the spirit right now in front of our eyes. And I think once we are able to go back into travel where um, the pandemic is over, we're going to see that blossom. It was beginning to blossom before the pandemic happened. We had um, our largest um, class of international students coming in through the Global Mission Center, um, and we had to defer all of them because they couldn't get visas to get into the country because of the pandemic. So I'm hopeful that once that pandemic is over, um, we'll begin to see this blossom. That's, that's really encouraging, Brian. I love that story of the, the, the seminary in Hong Kong, 21 seminaries. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? I mean, it's, I mean, and, I mean, you can, I mean, you can take the subway and just move around that island, like, you know, in a half a day and that many, that many seminaries. So, so that gives you a sense of their places in the world where, where people are hungry for theological education so they can put that theological education to use. So a, a couple of follow-ups, um, one is, and, and I, you know, I know, well, can you tell us, and for those on the call, kind of, what do you attribute this growth in the Southern Hemisphere? What's, what's the story behind that? Where, where, why is the church and the gospel uh, growing at that pace? Um, and then a second question, I think it's a really interesting and, and probably for a lot of folks, a new idea that, you know, that we, the place that sent missionaries, my grandparents were, my grandmother was the child of missionaries to China, that, you know, we who send missionaries are here, you know, now the mission field itself from those in the southern, and I'm, I'm curious about that dynamic, and where you, you know, what, what are some of the ministries that you have heard about that are taking place on, you know, in the U.S., um, where, where is that manifesting? Well, um, I think it's it manifesting in uh, the um, um, growth of uh, individual and smaller churches, um, even in the Richmond area, for example, where startup churches are beginning. Um, they're not denominationally affiliated because they're connected with international partnerships. So that's been an interesting um, development in the United States, I think. I mean, we've always had church startups in the U.S. I mean, that's not a, a unique thing, but to have church startups that have their genesis in international locations and international churches with a mission endeavor toward the U.S. as a mission field, that's an interesting thing. Um, some of it is because of different theological perspective. I mean, uh, that's one thing to, to, to note. Um, many churches in the Southern Hemisphere feel that the U.S. Um, and its churches and its theology is more progressive um, than, um, uh, and, and so they're, uh, in some cases, particularly in, 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 in South Korea, um, and also in Africa, um, where churches are locating in the United States, there's a desire to create a more um, theologically conservative perspective on the faith. And um, 
I think most people recognize uh, that in Africa, for example, um, theology and theological perspective is a bit more conservative than it is in the United States and in Europe, certainly. So that's one significant difference. Um, and you'll see that in many of the international mission-oriented church startups in the US. Uh, one thing I have found in significant uh, way in my travels is that um, um, I do have some um, interesting and sometimes robust conversations with um, 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 uh, members and with clergy about theological perspective. Uh, in Latin America, um, I've not been to South America. That's one place I've not had a chance to travel. But in Latin America, where we're building some connections, um, there is uh, a, a sense of um, connection with liberation theology from the perspective that I have been working with and the communities I've been working with that has been um, pretty significant and powerful. And that's because religion is vitally connected with the social and political circumstance of people. I think that's less the case in Africa and in Korea. Um, and I think the more um, that there is a similar engagement of the faith tradition with the social and the economic and the political conditions of the people, the more um, churches begin to have a sense of connection with circumstances that are beyond um, just individual faith relationship. And I'm not suggesting that's a negative, that's a, a, a huge positive because it's from your individual faith relationship that you grow into um, connection with a church community, with a broader world community around you. But I think as, um, as churches in um, the Southern hemisphere, see more of that connection, I think you're going to see an opening um, in terms of theological perspective in a similar way that you've seen in Latin um, America. Um, I think that's from what I've read beginning to happen in South America in the churches as well, um, particularly where you talk about um, situations where people are in, 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 in incredibly impoverished. Uh, that's one of those places where faith and, um, and uh, connection with uh, real circumstance, uh, social circumstance of people opens up and broadens kind of the theological perspective. So it's not just about one's relationship spiritually with God, it's also about how that relationship spiritually with God has an impact for how you are in relationship with people communally and what that means. If God is bringing you into a, a relationship of justification, there should be a relationship of justice and justification with the community of people in which you, you are part of God's family as well. So I think that's happening more and more as well. I was in Ghana um, uh, leading a, a travel seminar of students about four years ago. And it is interesting to me that um, you, I could see that happening on the ground when we went to a former um, uh, a, a colony of persons who had been lep who had suffered from leprosy. Um, they were um, a believing faith community. Um, the, the persons in that um, former um, 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 community of uh, uh, people who had been impacted by leprosy um, were very devoted in their faith, their Christian faith. Interestingly enough, they were in this community because even though they had been um, quote unquote cured of the physical disease, their families did not want them back. So they didn't have any place to go. So they were in a colony, quote unquote, because even though they no longer had the disease, their families were afraid of them and there were also stigmas attached. They were beginning now to think and talk with me and with the students who were there with us about how we understood God and Jesus connecting with them and the situation and circumstance they had and asking the question, wouldn't Jesus want us to be back in relationship and community with family? So see, what they were doing is challenging their, the faith understanding of their families because of the situation, the physical medical situation that had impacted them. They're now challenging in a very positive way, I thought, how they understood God was operating in the world. You could see their theological perspective changing right in front of your eyes because of what was happening to them or what had happened to them. And they wanted um, to, to, to have a way of, um, of um, understanding God's movement in the world and sharing that understanding of God's movement in the world with their families and their former faith communities. 
So there was one way where the Holy Spirit was working in this powerful way, almost like in the New Testament text, you know, where Jesus reaches out and touches lepers and draws them back into community. They're waiting for Jesus now through how they're working with other Christians coming into Ghana to do the same kind of thing, to draw them back into community, communities that don't want them because they've been stigmatized because of their, their, um, their, their, their past um, illness. So I see that as um, um, a way in which, you know, the, the world is getting smaller all the time. And as the world gets smaller, um, I think we learn from one another and our theological um, gifts are able to be shared with one another. And we also learn how we can help one another think more broadly about the faith. I think that's going to happen. It's naturally happening. Um, we're going to learn from people in the Southern Hemisphere. And I think they're learning from us. And I'm excited to see where, what that's going to do in the next 20 years. Um, and I'm excited to see where theological seminaries in the United States are going to be because of that relationship in the next 20 years. It's going to change us. Um, every time we bring in students and, um, and professors and, and, and PhD students from seminaries and churches in other parts of the world, um, it changes union. And when our students go and to um, these other places, even if it's a, for three weeks at a time, it changes those communities. So, you know, it's like the, 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 um, the um, parable Jesus talks about the, the, the yeast that's leavening the whole bread. I see that happening right now in terms of international theological um, education. So how, how what are you, in what ways can we who live in the U.S., whether it's a congregation, Union Seminary, um, how can we be better? How can we how can we be good partners? Like what are what are some postures that we can take? Um, what are some some assumptions we might need to set aside so that we can kind of endeavor to live into the partnerships that you're describing with that mutuality? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the first things we can do is what I'm trying to do with myself and I'm trying to help our students do, and that is let go of the sense that we're the ones who are able to teach um, from the first, from the get-go, that others have something to learn from us first and foremost because we have all this theological education and we have these significant churches and we have significant pastoral leadership, et cetera. You, as you know, uh, Penn, from your travels, you, you um, hit the ground in international um, um, faith communities. They don't have the resources that we have. Um, I mean, in some cases, it's, uh, uh, um, um, I was traveling um, in Ethiopia and Kenya and it's amazing the vast difference in terms of resources. One of the things we tend to think about is that, um, at least I do, and, um, is I um, unintentionally, um, and it's something I have to work on, I tend to look at uh, the resource base and think that because of the resource base, there's also a knowledge base. And because we have more of a resource base and knowledge base, I should be able to help teach what I have. I have to let go of that, that, um, that, uh, that, that sense of, pride and have a little bit more humility when I'm engaging with um, persons in international context. So for me, that's one of the first things. Don't think about what union has, all its resources, its library, its faculty, um, its um, you know, um, financial wherewithal, all, all these kinds of things. Um, don't think of that. Think of what I'm able to learn and find from the communities where I go. Look for the gifts that are in front of me rather than thinking about the gifts I can bring. So that for me is, I think, first and foremost for, for us in developed countries uh, when we are encountering um, or when we're traveling um, persons from other uh, um, um, uh, locations internationally. I think a second thing is um, to do, continue doing what you at first are doing. When I, you know, my heart jumps in a positive way when I hear you talk about the list of communities where you have partnerships. I hope that um, um, the members of FIRST will take advantage of being able as much as possible uh, to um, engage in those partnerships by traveling to those communities. And if not traveling to those communities, finding ways to um, have um, virtual connections like this one. Um, you know, I've um, been able and been blessed to talk with um, people in church communities through Zoom over the last year um, in places all over the world. Uh, get to know uh, them and uh, get to know uh, some of the, the things that are important in the life, their spiritual lives, uh, even though I can't be with them physically. Um, but then the other way is to invite um, persons um, in other communities 
to come and learn in our communities and to teach in our communities. Um, churches are able to do that, uh, not only funding uh, students to theological seminaries um, in the United States for um, a year or even three years, um, but also um, I've seen some wonderful partnerships here in the Richmond area. And I think um, we haven't done it in Charlotte because um, we don't have a, a you know dormitory residence halls in Charlotte, um, but we've actually had students from um, um, either theological seminaries in other parts of the world or churches in other parts of the world. They come and they stay at the seminary and they work in and live in a church community here in and around the Richmond area so that they are interns or they are um, assistant ministers. However, the church um, organizes or orchestrates that kind of administrative relationship so that they for a year become or live in ministry in a community here in the United States and then take that knowledge and understand standing back with them when they go back home. That's an exciting um, endeavor that churches are able, the churches with the resources are able to uh, make happen and make possible. Um, and that, I mean, uh, I know First Presbyterian in uh, Williamsburg has done that with students here. Um, we've had um, churches here in Richmond also do it. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ um, um, uh, Korean um, um, Presbyterian churches. So, I mean, th there are some exciting um, uh, creative ways to think about how you can connect the resources of FIRST with the needs of the wider global church. You've already begun to do that in your partnerships. I'd seek ways, you know, talk with, um, um, with me at Union, talk with Leanne down at Columbia, talk with Craig up at Princeton, see if you can build some partnerships where you can work with and identify students um, or um, Christian educators, because uh, sometimes we actually have people already Christian educators come to Union and study for a year and then go back into the context where they were. But you could build that kind of a partnership with these theological seminaries that are near to you um, in ways I think that might be really exciting for you as a congregation. I, it, it might be really exciting, for example, for you to have someone from one of these um, um, African or um, South American or um, Asian um, church communities to be at first for a year in ministry. You learn from them, they learn from you, and then they go back into ministry back in their home um, context. Um, I hope more and more that's going to happen through Union's uh, Global Mission Center. I'm, I'm excited about that possibility. Um, another way, and I, I just throw this out too, is another way that uh, we found this helpful for us at the seminary. And there, might, there are probably ways in which a church context can think about this as well. You do some travel seminars. I know that uh, Penn was talking about their travel to the Middle East. Maybe think about doing, uh, and, and, and the seminary in Cuba. Maybe think about doing a class. Um, what we're doing, this is one of our models. Um, and we had it in place. <laughs> I keep saying before the pandemic, so much disrupted our plans. I hear you. Yeah. Um, but just before the pandemic, it, we had with the, um, the Graduate School of Theology in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa. Um, uh, Sharon and I had traveled there with our academic dean. We built a relationship with the Global Mission Center. We had, um, um, we were going to have a church history class for a three week May period, um, Christine Luckris Marquis, our church historian in Richmond, was going to take seven students to the graduate theology, graduate school of theology in Ethiopia to Addis Ababa. Um, and uh, she was going to team teach with a professor from the graduate school of theology with seven students from the graduate school. So there's going to be a combined class in Addis Ababa of the graduate school of theology in Ethiopia and Union Presbyterian Seminary. And that class on church history would have been just, and it's going to be after the pandemic, but um, just a phenomenal experience. Think about that as a possibility um, um, doing in a theological circumstance in a seminary or in a church with church members um, who are interested in learning more about church history or the New Testament or the Old Testament. I mean, that's a possibility as well to think about um, doing a class like this one in an international setting. Um, I, I think um, um, I, would, I would encourage you to dream um, big about how you might be able to be impacted by the way others around the world think about their faith. You said something earlier that really resonated. I, I, I have been, I've not had the benefit of, of personally visiting each of our partners yet. Um, part of that is pandemic. Um, but, but I know that with, with each of our partners, um, mainly with uh, Mexico and Haiti and Russia, um, there are those 
there, there is, there is a theological difference we have to manage. And, you know, that, that looks like, you know, uh, not ordaining women or differences around um, theology of inclusion with human sexuality. And, um, you know, uh, at the risk of asking you to fix that problem, how do we fix that? <laughs> what, what are some, I mean, cause there is, you, you talked about humility and, and, um, um, and that sense of, of, of superiority, um, um, you know, and I, and, the 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 developing worlds we are we oh we we've evolved beyond where um, the the church has been planted so recently I mean that that creeps into my thinking uh, I think our thinking so um, knowing that and still yet trying to be um, um, committed to the decisions that we've made about things like inclusion and ordain, ordaining women how do how do we how do we navigate that. Well, um, in some cases, um, it's less navigation and more head-on collision. Um, I'll say that. Um, and we've had a few head-on collisions um, at Union um, as a result of that. And we've lost some um, friendships uh, um, because um, there are places where we're committed and um, we can't move away from that commitment. I mean, ordaining women. I mean, that, that just we, we're just not movable and we can have a conversation about it. Um, we're in terms of inclusion around sexual orientation. That's another, those are two key places, um, as you know, um, when we're talking about the Southern hemisphere. Um, we've had open and honest conversations with some church communities and we are still in relationship and still having open and honest conversations about that. Um, when we talk about um, uh, Ghana, for example, we've had a union well before I came to union had a has had a strong relationship with the um, um, uh, the Presbyterian Church of Ghana and the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Ghana. And this is one of those places where we are different. I mean, two of these places where we are different, um, um, for example. And we know those differences are there. And we've been able to be in conversation and to maintain community um, and to try to learn from one another. And we don't back down from saying, um, this is where we stand. And this is why we don't understand wh where you are, but we're trying to hear and we're trying to, um, to help you understand why it's important for us as Christians. Um, and we try to, at least from my perspective, try to make this a moment of teaching and opportunity for um, transformation. Um, I'm sure that is what some of my counterparts are thinking as well when they're talking to me. Um, so um, yes, we've had a few head on collisions. I think we'll have more. Um, I do think though that um, I am honestly believing we can be leaven in this regard. I believe in that parable um, that um, there is opportunity in teaching and relationship to begin um, and it takes a long period of time to begin to make transformation possible to make uh, help people think um, differently. You know, one of the things that is, is interesting to me is that um, when I've been in uh, many of these contexts, I've been seeing particularly women who are raising voices and questions in their own context and don't need help from us. Um, they're already raising the questions before we get on the ground um, in relationship in these church communities and settings. So for example, it's important for us when we send our first class to Ethiopia to the Graduate School of uh, Theology, it's important to me that Christine, a female faculty member, is going to be the representative from Union Seminary. Um, um, it was also important uh, that when we had our meetings with the uh, leadership of the Graduate School of Theology there, um, that uh, women leaders of the, uh, the Graduate School were in conversation with us. So um, I see possibilities. Um, we have a long road to go in that regard. And as you know, the church around the world um, is grappling with these issues right now. And in some cases, um, um, finding itself uh, tearing apart over these issues. Um, and what we don't want to do is to exacerbate that, to be in the middle of that. Um, but I do think we have a witness as a part of that. And I think it's important that we share that witness. I think that's part of our calling in this world church we're in. So I'm not um, hesitant to um, say we're different in that regard. And I'm not hesitant to witness to what we're doing in that regard and why I think it's important. And we have been, we have been trying to do that. I, that's uh that's always, I think, uh, well, not always, I shouldn't say, it's probably less of an issue um, for a theological seminary in partnership than it is with a church in partnership. 
I'll probably say that. Because, and, you know, and that's that's certainly the case um, with with our four global partnerships. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, I, I want to be mindful of time and give those who are on the call a chance to, to ask questions. Um, I should have thought about this before, um, um, whether to put them in the chat or to just shout out. I'm looking at Gerald and um, Gerald, are we going to put those in the chat or are we going to just call out the, the question we have? Uh, we have 43 online. It might work best either to put the question in chat or to raise your hand. Use the uh, button on the bottom to raise your hand. Um, yes. Let's do, thank you, Gerald. That, that, is, that is wise. Gerald is a uh, professional Zoom host. Um, so, yeah, if you have questions, please share those in the chat or raise your hand. And if I can't see your hand, Gerald will call on you. Um, John Tate has a question. Well, I'm we're so glad to have you here. Well, thank you, John. It's good to hear your voice. And uh, I'm looking for you. Oh, there you go. I see you. I see you. OK. You're a gift to the church. And for that, we're thankful. Uh, I want to stray a little bit away, if I may. And I hope I don't get my hand slapped too much. But how do you think the church is doing uh, in response to addressing the issue of inclusion and uh, particularly racial equity at this point and anti-racism? Yeah, that's a great question because it's live. It's a live question right now um, on the campus of the seminary. And, um, you know, uh, um, I'm not sure whether um, you all saw um, a piece that I wrote, um, I guess, uh, maybe six or seven months ago where I was talking about the fact that I would I was hoping that um, that uh, white Christians would be more visible and speak out more about these issues regarding racial inclusion. And I do want to say that I've been encouraged um, over the last uh, six months or so to see how churches have lived in and responded to um, this issue to be spokespeople witnessing, I mean, the churches themselves being witnesses. Uh, the churches I'm um, connected with um, in Virginia and North Carolina, but across the United States, the ones that Union is connected with, I've been very um, heartened by the way in which members have uh, written pieces, ministers have spoken and preached in sermons, and um, congregations have stepped up um, to be supportive of uh, issues about inclusion and equal rights and uh, concern for um, harm based on um, um, racial identity. So I think we have a ways to go in that regard, but um, I've been um, encouraged by the things that I've been seeing. So um, that's been helpful for me. The PCUSA um, as an entity has also been um, very outspoken in that regard. Uh, we have a Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation that operates out of the Charlotte campus um, that's been um, endowed by a wonderful gift from um, the, someone in the Charlotte community. And it has held workshops, um, online workshops and things uh, with regard uh, to that concern. And there have been, um, uh, those have been widely subscribed uh, by people, not just in Charlotte, but around the country. So I'm excited and encouraged that, um, that our churches and, um, and ministers are speaking out more and more about um, racial equity and racial inclusion. Um, so I'm encouraged about that, particularly the PCUSA. I've, 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 um, I've been, I've, um, I've just said, you know, um, I'm talking against being too prideful, but I've been, I've been somewhat proud of the Presbyterian church and how it's, it's tried to build um, alliances and how it's uh, spoken out on its own um, and how individual Presbyterian churches have done that. Um, I talked with, um, with uh, um, what was it? Was it the Presbyterian of New Hope or the Presbyterian of Charlotte? I can't remember which Presbyterian, um, but they were asking me how churches could um, think more about this. And you know, I, I, I encourage them to think the way John of Patmos did. And that is, you know, John looks into the future and sees what he understands to be how we will be in relationship with God in the future, where people of every tribe and tongue and nation and language are before the throne of God. If that is indeed the future, it is beholden upon us 
to do all we can to realize that future in our present. And every time a church does that by how it speaks, by how it calls out to others, by how it uses its resources to make that reality a present, not just a future hope, but a present reality, I'm encouraged. And um, I encourage churches to try to live out that future in the midst of our present with the resources and the people they have. And, and again, I think um, we're making strides in that regard. Brian, I, I, John's question raises to mind to me too, just thinking about the global church, what a, what a benefit another perspective uh, would bring for our own nations grappling with racism and slavery and our own um, uh, ugly history in that regard. They don't have that, they, they, they have a different experience. And I, I, I think there's probably theological insight that comes from not being in the crucible um, that the United States has been in since, you know, for the last 400 years. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is a question on the screen, and then I've got a Rich Neidinger has a question. Um, uh, what are some, what are some of those main theological differences that you've, you've encountered, uh, and, and I think significant part of this question is, and learned from. So where, you know, where, where, when you bumped up globally to theological difference, have you learned from that new perspective? Ah, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of, of the, the key ones that would be significant for me. Um, um, and I think it's a change in my perspective on how God moves in the world through um, the lack of privilege. And when I say that, you know, my daughter was talking to me the other day about the workshop she had been in in one of her classes and they were ranking privilege and she realized that she was way up on the top scale of privileged person. And when I go to a different country, um, South Africa comes to mind, especially, and I saw the poverty amongst the black community in South Africa. And I thought, wow, well, you know, and I just said it, um, you know, about some of the other countries I've been in, the privileged perspective that I have in terms of economic resources, political resources, the freedom of speech, all the kinds of things that I have. Um, I have learned um, that people who, um, in countries where they have very little in terms of resource base are still able to live with a sense of hopefulness and to um, encourage and teach those who have much more than they have how God is moving in a powerful way in the world. An example, um, one of the most impactful things that has ever happened to me in my travels is uh, in South Africa where I was um, taken to um, a place of extreme poverty. I mean, it's hard to describe how people were living in this community. And we drove through uh, miles of just, just tortured impoverishment. And at one point in the middle, uh, as we were getting to the middle of this community, we could hear in a different language, but we knew the melody, um, these hymns that were being sung. And we were going to a worship service in the middle. It was right in the middle of this community. And here people were singing praise to God in the midst of circumstances where I think I would have simply been broken. Um, I don't know how one's faith is maintained in the midst of that. And talking to the people in this community about their hope and their belief and their trust in God and their belief that people like me wouldn't just come and see, but would commit to help change the circumstance they were seeing. They believed in me and the people who were with me and the miss, and they, that's why they were singing and that's why they were preaching and that's why they wanted us to be in their worship. Cause they didn't want us to worship with them just because they were having church in South Africa. They wanted us to worship because they believed we could bring some of the impact of God's transformational power into their midst. And they kept singing they kept believing it and they kept believing God would act. And that is very much like, you know, how I 
talk about what John is talking about in the book of Revelation, where these people, John's people, feel they are in the midst of this great affliction, and yet they continue to believe God will do something about it. How will God do something about it? Well, they don't know that yet, but they just trust and know God will do something about it. The people in South Africa, they were trusting that we would go back to our home churches and our home country, and we would press for the kind of change that could help make a difference in their community. I've learned that... Um, that uh, God is on the move in ways I can't see. And because of all the things I have, I have often dismissed. I have learned to trust that even where I can't see God making a difference in a visible way, that God is making a difference. I just haven't been able to see it yet. But I've also begun to see how important my participation and movement with God is to the kind of transformation God is doing in the world. So um, I've been able to see hope in a way that I've never understood, and I still don't quite understand. And I still don't quite understand how the kind of the, the kind of hope I saw in South Africa that that Sunday morning. I just don't understand it, and I'm trying to learn it. I'm trying to learn from it and I'm trying to be a better person because of it. Um, I'm trying to figure out how people who have so little believe so much. And I learned that in those contexts. And I also feel continually that I have, with all that I have, um, much more responsibility to do than, I'm, than I've been doing. So I feel continually called. Conversations I've had with lots of members who've gone on um, mission trips. Um, so, uh, Rich Nyinger has the, the last question. We're, we're almost oh. at the hour <laughs> of time. So, Rich. Okay. Uh, well, one comment and then a very specific question. Uh, the comment is I've been on a number of uh, uh, mission trips to uh, Mexico and Russia. And uh, I know in our differences of uh, ordaining women and things like that. Uh, we don't, we try not to get into <laughs> arguments with anybody. We kind of put, we're happy to say, we're going to try to set that aside and, and instead just experience each other's faith and, uh, and how we uh, care for the people in Christ's name. So, uh, but uh, I will say one thing and it ties with what you've said about uh, we did, we're a witness in just being there. And I think the women that are the leaders on our trips, we're, we're not trying to, to, to say something through this. We're just, they're just the people that are with us and they can become some of the most uh, beloved of the people on our trip. I think of like Katie Crow in, in, in Mexico. And I mean, with our team, she just brought everybody together in, in, in appreciation for the ministry that was going on. And uh, I think that's a great witness in it just in and of itself. Okay, uh, now to my question, which is very specific. You can comment on anything there. I appreciate all you've said, but uh, you mentioned Hong Kong very early on and it probably perked a number of our ears. We know there's so much crackdown there by the Chinese government. Has this presented a problem, do you know, for these seminaries in uh, Hong Kong? That's a, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. I don't know because uh, we went um, a year before the crackdown began to occur, and I was in communication um, with um, uh, there there are some professors at one of the schools who are members of the the the, um, the Society of Biblical Literature, and I was supposed to talk with one of them when uh, we were having a, a Society of Biblical Literature meeting in the U.S. Um, uh, the crackdown began somewhat shortly um, after my last communication um, with him on that. Um, I, I've not had, a, 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 um, I mean, we haven't been able to continue in terms of building the relationships because I think we did actually do a memorandum of understanding with that particular, it's a, it's a divinity school of a university there. Um, and uh, they built relationships across the years. Uh, so the short answer is I don't know um, what has happened. Um, um, I have been in conversation with uh, just one person, one of our um, our um, our vice president of advancements, uh, brother and brother-in-law and sister. 
um, live on live in Hong Kong. So I've just learned from him some of the circumstances that um, that uh, people are going through and undergoing. Um, as I understand it, the seminaries are still um, operational and still doing their work. Um, um, I do know that much, but I don't know how they're faring in terms of day to day circumstances and situations. So, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know that that strikes me to send an email out on tomorrow morning to to find out. We don't we don't have um, we do have a, a, a global mission center advisory member in Taiwan who can tell us about, you know, when tensions rise between Taiwan and China. Although I haven't talked to him about the latest tension, you know, with the Chinese Navy um, um, uh, moving so close to Taiwanese waters. Um, but um, we don't have that continuing link yet in Hong Kong. So um, we don't have that kind of conversation. But I do know that they're still operational. I just don't know what they're undergoing. Yeah, and and just and, and for your observation, Richard, I, I will say, um, uh, being a New Testament professor as well as a seminary president opens up opportunity for me on these travels actually to um, prod about these questions um, even before they're raised um, in a biblical context. And I take advantage of that. You know, um, I go to teach New Testament. And so when I'm teaching about Jesus touching the lepers or Jesus engaging with women and calling them into discipleship, um, I ask um, um, people in communities like in Africa and in South Korea, um, how they understand what Jesus is doing. So I, you know, um, I, I have actually um, um, not just waited to hear about those conversations, but have kind of pushed us into those conversations. Yeah. Because I, I want them to think as much as I, they want me to think. <laughs> Brian, thanks again for your time this morning. Um, I, I know your time is, is, uh, stretched with all that you do. Um, and I will certainly uh, make good on um, our conversation to have you come preach. We would love for that to happen soon. Um, so we can coordinate about that, looking at the maybe this this fall um, or next spring. 